you could think that everything in the world points to you wanting to short the stock and then it continues to go up for the next year and you'd be like what the heck goes on right but if you hold it for 10 years it really should balance out and you should realize that value that you sought after initially when you made that investment mm -hmm. i'm going to be watching that short report so closely tomorrow <laughs> because if the short <laughs> position has come down a ton then you know that was a squeeze over the last month and i would be yeah. way more likely to, to take some kind of position myself, whether I short it directly or do it through an options contract, but yeah. tomorrow's the day. So maybe I'll, I'll let you know what I ended up. Actually, <laughs> uh, Edge Inside subscribers will know exactly what we do and we'll share our research. What's up, my friends? Welcome back. Episode 14 of the Beyond the Edge podcast. Pete, off sick today. You got me and Declan, Mr. Fundamentals and Small Cap Kev holding it down. We got a wicked uh, agenda today. We're coming back to a stock we've talked about in the past, that Soundhound, because the thing's just going absolutely mental. It's not super clear why, but we're going to talk about that. We got a couple other exciting companies to get into today. Real cool, growthy stock investing episode today, and we're covering uh, quite a bit of ground. So, Mr. Fundamentals, Deck, you ready to ready to get into this? I know you're I know you're on the edge of your seat, trying ready to dig into Soundhound. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm ready to pitch this bad boy and uh, keep hopefully uh, pounding it to the ground. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, long and strong, not quite. Okay, so first topic today. It's been exactly three weeks since we brought up Soundhound AI. That's a stock that's just gone crazy and captured the attention of many many investors, retail. Primarily, if you look at the chat rooms, that becomes very clear. I'm almost like embarrassed to say since we brought them up three weeks ago, the stock's up 113%. And I'll just admit it right here. None of us like it. <laughs> uh, you know, Pete's not here right now, so I'll let him speak for himself. But that's where his uh, thoughts concluded last time is that we weren't particularly overly impressed. So some context. A um, few key points. If you don't recall, Soundhound translates voice input into meaning through an integration in one case with ChatGPT. What's so special about their tech is essentially how fast it is. If you used any kind of conversational chatbot, you can see the, the latency, like the delay between when you ask a question and when it answers is usually quite large. And apparently SoundHound has supposedly nailed that. Their, their demos certainly make it look like they've nailed the conversational AI aspect. Um, it's been widely shared that NVIDIA took a stake in SoundHound, but Mr. Fundamentals here busted that and realized it actually wasn't a new purchase. This was way back as part of a financing round of $75 million back in 2017, of which, you know, NVIDIA, obviously the, the share price in SoundHound changes by the daily, but it was, when reported, it was 3.6 million. I guess it's a lot higher now. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> Our kind of final thoughts on this stock where we wound up last time was basically that none of us really understood what was so magnificent about their tech. It clearly was, you know, promising and they have a lot of name brand partners, but it wasn't really, really obvious how strong of a competitive advantage they had. So Declan, um, let's get right into it. Let's talk about their fundamentals <laughs> or lack thereof. Um, and their future growth prospects, does that justify a current $2.6 billion valuation? So simply put, not at all. Um, <laughs> when you look at it, they went from uh, price to earnings or sorry, price to sales of like 12.7 when we last discussed them. And they're now up to a 43 PE or price to sales again, sorry. And when you look at that, as well as their price to book, which is at 191 right now, the valuation seems quite dislocated from what the fundamentals are actually. And as a reminder, I mean, the business lost about $81 million in the past year, and it has grown some revenue, but overall the performance has been quite mediocre, I would say, for an AI business particularly. Now, they still have a decent cash cash position of about $95 million. So that's at least one year of burn rate that they can continue to grow and still lose money and reinvest in the business. But it just doesn't make sense why a business of this size and this caliber deserves a valuation of that standpoint. And, you know, like you said, Kev, they were part of an, a value or a private placement deal before they went public with NVIDIA that raised about $75 million. And this was across multiple investors. But I think you got to keep in mind that NVIDIA is a $2 trillion company that makes about $35 billion per year and has like $26 billion in cash. So when they make a $3.7 million investment, that is barely even making a decimal mark on its balance sheet. And so 
I think you got to realize that, okay, maybe if the business or NVIDIA had invested, say, maybe 10% or bought up 10% of the company, that it's worth considering more because obviously there's more conviction tied to that business. But when you see just such a small fraction of an investment made in a company like this, you should really take that with a grain of salt and also not really factor it that much into your whole assessment of the business overall. So I'm curious if you agree with that. Do you think it's kind of stayed in a, in a range of fair value or what are you thinking? Well, yeah, I mean, I have to agree with you. There's no fundamental financial metric you can look at on the stock and say that it's fairly priced right now. It's clearly retail driven and it's the only kind of massive catalyst I can see is that they have this massive order backlog uh, of, I believe it was $661 million order backlog. And I would guess a lot of retail investors are looking into that saying, hey, that's probably, you know, next year or two years away. And then kind of basing the business fundamentals on that. But there's a few things. There's a lot of things. But one thing I'd mentioned about that is I kind of digged up what looked into what is the actual definition of, you know, bookings and backlog, et cetera, just to see how much can they play with that terminology. And long story short, it actually does sound fairly solid. Like it sounds like you would be very aggressive to use those terms if it wasn't actual revenue that was going to be expected. There's just a few things. One, though it is revenue that you expect to book in the future, I'm almost positive there's going to be some kind of breakup clause. Perhaps could be technology doesn't deliver as performed. It could be too delivered too late. Uh, maybe new competition comes in offering a sizable like disc discount in price or an advancement. I'm sure there's a million ways these companies can back up. So that's the first thing I'd say. I wouldn't take that backlog too, too, too seriously. Not to mention, even if it is, you know, to be taken seriously, we don't know when it's going to be delivered. Is it going to be a small amount per year over the next 10 years? Is it going to be 300 million a year over two years? We just don't know. There's too many questions there to really hang your hat on that one piece of information. That's the first thing I'd say. You know, second thing I'll say is that just like you mentioned, it, this is a money losing company. They are certainly not profitable. Um, you know, they're, they're pushing almost $100 million in a loss in a year. That's a significant loss per year. And the revenue is very small. Fine. I'll give them credit. 80% growth year over year, at least looking at the last quarter. But we're talking about a $17 million quarter. It's not big. Yeah. So let's kind of adjust this. It's obviously clear to the audience. We're not stoked on this stock from a fundamental standpoint. But what I'm really trying to wrap my head around is this isn't the first stock we've come across that has horrible financials, really cool product and really cool pipeline and very engaged investor audience that has taken off. <laughs> so part of me wants to think, I don't want to just rule out all companies because they've got bad financials. There's clearly more to it when it comes to a stock. So I was trying really hard to put my mind in the perspective of a retail investor that would be buying this stock, that's maybe not looking as intensely at fund fundamentals as we are. And there's a few things that I came to mind with is the total addressable market for using their technology. It, it's massive. I mean, you go to McDonald's drive through you're, you're talking, you know, you can talk to a chat bot, you can download their app on your phone and have like a really good, like a, a Siri 2.0 or 3.0, like a much better version and on and on and on. There's a million applications for it, but a couple things come to mind. Now, number one, the concept that they discuss is how powerful their technology is that it skips a step where typically voice recognition will, will hear the voice, it'll transcribe it into text, and then uh, a model will interpret that into meaning. They apparently kick out the middleman and they can speed things up by interpreting voice into meaning immediately. So at first glance, that actually sounds like a fairly big breakthrough. It is what Siri is you know, and when it was released, whatever, over 10 years ago, better. But what says that Google or Microsoft or Apple doesn't make a, a far better version? Now, Apple, I wouldn't worry about because they're going to use it for their own devices. You probably won't see Apple powering a McDonald's drive through <laughs> But Google, totally different story. I could absolutely see Google going after this. Um, they're in all kinds of areas that you wouldn't even know about, like security at airports. They use their technology for that. So Google's everywhere. So I think competition is going to be fierce. I, I will talk a lot more about that but I'm just deviating so far away from what you originally said of, is there any kind of financial sense to this? And no, there's not. But like, I'm really trying to put my head in the space of a retail investor. And, and the more I go, the deeper I go, the more I don't like this stock. <laughs> so it's going against me. And as much as I want to be devil's advocate, like I just can't. Declan, is there anything you like about this company? Like, is there something that does get you excited we can work with here? Well, I think like you mentioned, obviously their tech, 
technology has performed well and they have an advantage to date when it comes to that voice rec or voice recognition and then also translating and then generating it back. Um, but the thing here is that obviously SoundHound has benefited tremendously from the AI boom that has just taken over the entire market, the entire world. Everybody is focused on it. And, you know, they've been working at this for quite some time. So they position and they deserve to benefit from it. I think it's just bringing it back to reality that you have to really understand what is that competitive advantage. And like you said, Kev, there's a lot of big players out there. And I feel like they being able to invest in this space are going to be able to catch up to a company like SoundHound AI. Now, They've carved out a little niche. They work for both like voice and customer call centers, as well as at restaurants and everything. And so they may be able to put or position themselves in those markets where other players don't just don't see perhaps the value to go in there as well. Maybe it's too small of a pool for them. Um, but here is a business that has, you know, existed for quite some time. They built up a sizable patent portfolio and they're doing what they can based on their fundamental situation, their cash position, what they've already invested in the business. And it's just a matter of can they man maintain that position. So when I look at it, it's just difficult for me to find a company like this that hasn't turned a profit yet and is competing in a realm with giants that are really going to be, you know, nipping at their heels constantly. And so I think it's one of those things that with a business like this, you just have to be really grounded in how you're assessing them. Yes, there's a great opportunity. Potentially, the total addressable market is massive. But how much can a company like this take from other players? And so I'm curious, like, Kev, do you see, I know this is more of a, a peak question than everything, but do you see there being some sort of value advantage when it comes to their data compared to other players, like, say, a Reddit or even a media company like Wall Street Journal? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. And actually, I went on the biggest detour of all time yesterday and stayed up till midnight reading about large language <laughs> models. Because obviously, we know about AI, we talk about this a lot, but I like I wanted to go like way deeper, like how does an AI model get trained? And if you do that, good luck, have fun. Like it's, it's, it's very heavy, but at a high level, I'm getting it now. The reason I was going down that path is because I wanted to understand when I saw the partnership between um, chat GPT and SoundHound, I wanted to understand where does SoundHound's technology end and ChatGPT's begins? Like, who's the one delivering the value? And it wasn't super clear. And I did realize that that ChatGPT example was for one specific product. It was like a chat app that needed access to ChatGPT's massive, massive brain so that it could answer everyday questions. Most of the applications for SoundHound seem to be very use case specific. So not like a large language model that it's going to be trained on that has like petabytes of data. It'll be like the user manual of a car, right? So it'll have these like, or, or the, the menu items at a restaurant. So it knows what's gluten-free and what has lots of sodium and what doesn't. Um, it, it seems to be very like custom to a specific solution. So I would say that their data sets probably aren't their biggest value there because if I understand correctly, I think for the most part, they're using other people's data. Their main core technology comes back to voice AI and their ability to take verbal speech and understand what it means and, and work it into a usable format for, in the case of their chat app, for chat GPT, then to be able to answer the question and do a lot of the heavy lifting. So I don't want to like write off how valuable their technology is because I honestly do think it is powerful. Um, I have a demo actually booked for next week with a company called Air AI. And I saw, uh, where did I see this on TikTok or Instagram? But it was a, it was a video of, there's two videos. One of this Air AI assistant booking a test drive for a Tesla. And then the other example was it actually following up with a customer who abandoned an Apple Vision Pro in their cart. And then it called them to try to sell them on it again. And it was really, really compelling. But the one thing that I did notice in the demo is that the latency in the answer is actually slower and it does actually make a difference. So I'll give SoundHound credit that as far as I can see, they do actually seem to have a bit of a technical advantage here. Just like you were saying though, how long does that last? And when you look at the technologies we're going to talk about in this episode, like flying cars, <laughs> and we've talked about everything from, you know, nuclear reactors to going to the moon to like, you name it, this just doesn't feel on par with that level of breakthrough. So yeah. my gut just tells me they're going to be competed away. 
And mm-hmm. let, let me and let me let me point out a couple a couple of interesting things because we saw this massive run. It's really not clear. There was no like massive piece of news that like blew our minds. Like they put um, they put financials out, which like weren't very good in, in my opinion. Um, but I saw a couple interesting things. Like one, we'll find out tomorrow what the current number is. But as of yesterday, it was up to 18% of the shares in the float were sold short. So mm-hmm. I would not be in the least bit surprised if the last month or two was a short squeeze. And it was probably a lot of those investors buying back their shares to cover their short positions. So that's number one. At the same time, over the last three months, uh, both co-founders have been selling uh, over a million shares each. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's not give them too hard of a time. CEOs deserve some level of liquidity, especially after being on the grind for so long. But it's never a great sign to see um, to see the co-founders, you know, at a frothy time, putting money in their own pockets. It kind of makes you wonder, like, should I be doing the same thing? So yeah. I could keep going on and I, I intend to, but I mean, you know, let's just freestyle it, saying it over to you. I don't have a direct question, but just w- what else like stands out about this company to you? Yeah. Well, big thing, like you said, is customer experience. I think that is where their advantage exists right now. They clearly can avoid that latency issue and produce almost a seamless experience with the technology. Uh, going back to the data side of things, I think it's also interesting to understand what kind of data the company can collect on its customers and that experience. And I'm curious, do the companies that they partner with, say it's a restaurant, do they own the rights to that data or does SoundHound also get access to that? And then how much value is that data actually bringing on to the business? So it it seems like it's not very much just because of the fact that you know a lot of these interactions are not really diving deep into consumer behavior. Sure, somebody might like, ordering a double cheeseburger versus a chocolate milkshake kind of thing. But it's not really that big of a difference or a game changer in terms of, say, we go back to our conversation about Reddit and Google and Google wanting to pay Reddit, what is it, like $60 million for its data. So it doesn't have that core advantage from a data standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to this business, it's just you're in a position right now where the stock has shot up tremendously. It benefited, like you said, could be a short squeeze could be just a culmination of things as well, uh, including the NVIDIA investment and all these other run-ups. But I think it's just, you got to be really dialed in to what you would want to pay for this business. And one thing that I like to do whenever I'm assessing a company is look at it as if I was going to buy the company as a whole. And when I see it, I just cannot justify a $2 billion valuation for a company like this at this time. Maybe if it realizes its full potential, that can be true, but it just doesn't seem in a good position that over the next five to 10 years, it can either maintain this or grow beyond this point. So to your point about the CEO selling, I mean, Mm -hmm. take your wins in that sense as a, say, an investor in a capital markets player, but you're not necessarily, or it doesn't instill confidence as an investor or shareholder when you see that happen. So that's probably a good sign when the guy who probably understands the business, the bet, or best is getting out. So that's well, just guess my what? final the, thought. Yeah. The guy who understands the tech the best, the chief product officer, he sold mm-hmm. even more shares than the CEO. Oh, so no. <laughs> 1.8 million versus 1.2. So just another little icing on the icing on the cake. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh boy. I forget what you said. So I, I ran the number. My price to sales was over 50 times. I forget. Is that what you said? Something similar? Yeah. I, price think, to, I think it was like 46 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I just, just for kicks, like, I don't know if this is like an apples to orange comparison or if this is an apples to apples, but I was just looking at what Big Bear gets for their price to sales. And it's just over three times now, Hmm. massive difference. There's a massive difference in the companies too. Like Big Bear is just not growing. It's a growth stock with no growth, (laughs) like literally (laughs) a pretty much a 0% growth over the year and quarter. Um, Their gross margin is less than half and they've got less than six months runway. Whereas in spite of the amazing ability to burn cash of uh, SoundHound, they actually have over a year, close to 15 months based on current burn. So much longer Mm -hmm. runway. So certainly the companies aren't the same, but I'm sorry, 50 times versus 3.38. It's just not even in the same world. So good luck to all. Um, I wanted to point one thing out. So when I go into a prospectus or just the financial statements, I will admit to glazing over the risk section, (laughs) probably one of the more uh, important sections. But the thing is, you just get so used to it being like over the top doom and gloom, like this company will go bankrupt in 12 months. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like not to that extent, but they're pretty like 
pretty rough and it's very legalized, but I just read through it for the, for the sake of just understanding what the company says are its risks. And I found some pretty bad uh, bullet points. So this is quote, directly quoted, our use of open source technology could impose limitations on our ability to commercialize our software. Is SoundHound using mostly open source? <laughs> Can any other company download this code? I don't know. I God, I hope not for their sake, but that was a massive red flag that I'd like to look into more. Um, okay, second off, this is again a direct quote, and it's a little longer. The market for SoundHound's products and technologies is characterized by intense competition. Evolving industry and regulatory standards, emerging business and distribution models, disruptive software technology developments, short product and service life cycles, price sensitivity on the part of customers, and frequent new product introductions. And there's more. Um, it actually gets worse. So why don't I just finish it? Uh, blah, blah, blah. All, certain alternative to SoundHound's products from other vendors, which may be offered at a significantly lower cost or free of charge. So this is directly coming from the company. They didn't say it's a fairly competitive industry. They said it's intense competition and competitors may charge zero for their competing products. Um, and they mentioned that they're using open source technology. So like, I don't want to say that's a smoking gun, but it's, it's like, if that's not a massive red flag, if we haven't just made a video of like 10 red flags about SoundHound, and, and <laughs> like if, if that's not amazingly clear to the audience, how bad this company is, then like, I don't know what to do with you guys. <laughs> I want to like yep. this thing because it does have cool technology, but just everything mm -hmm. points me to a sell. But I mm -hmm. even started looking at options and start looking at shorting. And I'll admit I'm a little too chicken to do that as well because like, when when something's retail powered like this and AI is the sector to be in, this thing's got such momentum. It's so scary to bet against something like that. But do I think in the next six months, this stock's going to be significantly less, possibly mm -hmm. even to the tune of 50% less? Yeah, I I legitimately think that, and I'll go on the record as saying that right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I I second that. I yeah. I kind of feel that within the next six months, and obviously I'm I'm not, or I'm in a similar position where I'm not going to put my stake on the line in terms of short selling. But I do believe that there is a correction overdue. And you actually just raised one good point that I think is really important for investors to really consider when they're assessing AI companies right now. And I think that is what we're doing here as well is being critical of these stocks. You know, you want them to work. It's awesome technology. And a lot of the new innovations that are coming about are really exciting, but you just have to be or stay grounded with your assessment because there's a difference between buying into an idea and making an investment. And a lot of things right now are highly speculative everybody's banking on these things just going to the moon and everything's going to be a trillion dollar market and it's just so too or it's too early to tell like you don't know if any of these businesses are worth what they truly are and you just to bring up one final point that you talked about is well if they're competing with players that are offering their products and services for almost free like that's a common thread across a lot of these companies like even chat gpt like you can use gpt 3.5 completely for free at zero cost to you. And that's the way you have to work a business model that finds another avenue that creates value. And now it seems like obviously with partnerships, SoundHound AI does have that. But if somebody comes out and says, hey, you can download this into your software, it takes five minutes to set up and we can do almost exactly the same thing. Sure, you may have a little latency, but it performs just as well. Well, that almost wipes out its entire moat or whatever competitive advantage it had. So you just have to be critical and, and stay grounded, but it, it should also, when an opportunity in this market speaks to you and it's like, you tried to be critical, you tried to invert the story and it says, well, nope, there's still like value to be had in this investment. Well, that should speak volumes in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Um, <clears throat> like, let's see where this thing goes. I mean, a couple other key points here. In 2021, three customers accounted for 61% of the revenue. Fast forward to 2023, two customers account for 62% of the revenue. So massive concentration risk here. Uh, something else to keep, that's something to keep an eye on. I can keep going, but I feel bad at this point. I got to give it a rest. Um, <laughs> Sorry, love the technology. Down. I could see this being a, a company that gets taken out by a big peer, Google, Apple, somebody like that. You know, maybe Apple buys something like this to improve Siri probably makes more sense for a company like Google that's more willing to, or Microsoft that's more willing to license products uh, to other people's soft uh, hardware. 
Um, mm. But I mean, I just, I, I would be very shocked if one of these companies would pay $3 billion for this. Right. I'm sure they could develop a similar tech for significantly less than that. So one way or another, I think a correction's coming. And uh, yeah, winter's coming. Watch out. Don't be, don't be <laughs> caught holding the bag. <laughs> yep. Likewise. Um, so on a completely unrelated topic, let's talk about shoes <laughs> on holdings. So here's a, here's our shoe brand that I was actually introduced to only a few months ago. Um, it's fairly under the radar though. It is actually a big company. It does have some big like celebrity support, a couple pieces of information on this. They, they put out earnings, which were actually good earnings and the stock got smoked. Um, it was down, I think 14%. It's recovered a bit since then, but it was a bit of a head scratcher because, why would, a, why would an excellent company showing growth get smoked? And it seems like they, they were done dirty essentially by a currency exchange that did not go in their favor. So a couple of key points. Uh, the stock dropped after earnings because they missed analyst estimates. But the only reason they missed those analyst estimates were because of the currency exchange. The only thing we like about this is that it actually briefly dipped the stock below $10 billion market cap. So we can actually talk about it because it fell into our coverage universe. Um, and this is one that's been on the radar for a while. Uh, they reached a record 46.2% of their sales direct to consumer. That's excellent. Obviously for margins, not going through a middleman. That's fantastic. Control your supply chain. Um, back to the foreign currency, uh, specifically it was a Swiss franc had strengthened, yet most, and which is where they report their earnings, yet most of the sales happen outside of Switzerland, mostly in America. Um, so their U.S. sales, their U.S. assets all had to be written down as the price of the Swiss franc, franc increased. Um, had it not been for that, their $40 million loss over this last quarter actually would have been a profitable quarter. So kind of a bummer for on, but maybe, maybe a little bit of a win for us that we can actually talk about these guys. So, so Declan, like, let's talk about, you know, how does on's 2023 performance reflect its, I guess, commitment to growth and profitability as indicated by the reported sales increase and pretty impressive gross margin. Yeah. So first and foremost, I think when you look at this business, it does appear a bit overvalued, at least to me, it has a price or trailing price to earnings of like 116 and a price to sales of 10.5. So it may be overpriced. And when you're in market conditions, like we are right now, anything, even it, like, as we mentioned here, the earnings report was pretty solid and yet the stock tanked. And that's likely to happen probably for the near term anyways, until it kind of reaches that fair valuation or ONS growth continues to propel itself to actually justify that price. Now, when talking on their performance overall, like like you said, this company has really burst on the scene um, probably a few months ago. Most people hadn't heard of it. And now you're seeing it line up in retail stores everywhere, as well as really doing a good job, like you said, of 46% direct to consumer sales. So They've clearly set themselves up in a highly competitive market that includes companies like Nike, Lululemon, Adidas, and you can keep going on forever, right? And but what they what I think they do well is that they've set themselves up in a position where they want to be a key player that, like you said, outside of just the US, which is largely dominated by companies like Nike and Lulu, and they've been able to really gain traction there. So They've sold over 50 million units and they're located at over 60 countries now. And, you know, their revenue was growing by 46% year over year and net profits at like 38% on an annual basis. So they, they've done a really good job in a market that is highly competitive to be able to position themselves where they are offering really the same product and mimicking the same business model as these highly successful retail companies, but almost doing a better job. Like I ran the comparable number across these other uh, large companies and Nike's gross margin was 44%. Adidas was 48. Lululemon's is 46 and on has a 60.4% gross margin. So that's clearly impressive and, and they're doing well versus those competitors. Now, as they grow and and they are the smallest business right now in that comparable segment but as they grow will they be able to maintain that well at least for the foreseeable future absolutely so they're doing a great job they have people like Roger Federer signed on and they're going to continue to sign on major athletes and that obviously seems to be the game in this market where if you can get big names to back your products then you are going to do extremely well in this business and Roger Federer is no slouch in the tennis world and mm -hmm. I'm certain there's going to be more I think Roger was actually an early investor, uh, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Really? 
Yeah, a good buddy of mine. He's uh, one of their head guys in marketing. So that's actually how I found out about this company. Um, it's just amazing. It's one of those companies you don't know exists, but as soon as you know that it does, you see them everywhere. Like when I'm walking mm-hmm. around Equinox, I'm constantly seeing them. Yet if I were to ask a random person, hey, what do you think of on you know, running? Well, first off, most people don't even know how to pronounce the name of the company. They think it's like, what is like QC or everybody gets the, the, logo, the, yeah. <laughs> the name wrong. Um, yeah. But it's gaining popularity for sure. And mm-hmm. okay, there's a few things you said that I want to touch on that I think are really interesting. So price to earnings, I, I guess it, you know, do we use the trailing 12 months? Do we use... Uh, the last like 2023 or whatever, I used 2023 and I got a price to earnings of 130 times. Yeah, that's right. wild. <laughs> Especially when you're looking at Nike, closer to 29 times. Uh, Crocs, I used, I found that as a comparable, kind of a niche <laughs> footwear brand, uh, yeah. 9.6 times. So yeah, by by those metrics, it, it's wildly overpriced. But a couple things to note, if you look at the statements specifically, again, coming back to the currency um, fluctuations, you actually see them record $111 million expense um, that obviously cut their net profit more than in half, but that expense had nothing to do with business operations, purely a currency transaction because they're moving assets from the US uh, to Switzerland. Had it not been for that, the price to earnings ratio would have been less than half. So still high, it's still elevated, it's still over 50 compared to, like I said, you know, Nike at 30. But then like you, let's go back to like the growth numbers, you know, Nike, Constant currency basis grew 16% year over year, which, I mean, give them credit for a giant company. That's huge. (laughs) That's massive growth. Um, On a currency adjusted basis, on grew 55%. So blazing fast. And you mentioned 60% gross margins. As the company scales, I think those margins actually go up. They clearly have pricing power. They've got a very premium shoe that people love. Um, I'm I'm a diehard now that I have them. I'll I'll most likely (laughs) buy just those going forward. I think that margin's going up. Um, and even if growth comes down a little bit, I think they're, they're still doing doing quite well. Um, other thing I wanted to mention is since the currency fluctuation worked against us in this quarter, uh, or pretty much for, or definitely the quarter, but also for the full year, look at what's happened since December 31st to now with the Swiss franc. It's actually weakened against the US dollar. So I think we're going to see some of that in the reverse. So some of those, we're actually, I think we're going to see a blockbuster quarter coming up, which then you'll have to use your brain to, to adjust downwards. Um, But then again, the algorithmic traders and the retail investors reading headlines, it's just that it'll be another confusing quarter that may quarter that may just look like a a blowout quarter and and send the stock moving higher. So I think we actually have a good quarter coming up. And I think that price to earnings ratio is going to going to come down significantly in the near future. Yeah. Well, and that brings up a good point. I think that's obviously a big risk when it comes to this business. But how that affects the business fundamentally is probably less of an important factor is that current con- currency conversion risk and i think it's 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 really interesting that this business today trades at 10 billion dollars and i think nike's at like 150 billion dollars adidas is like a 50 billion dollar company and same with lululemon um but so it begs the question well can it reach that sc- size and scale and it seems like there's clearly an opportunity where it can. They have continued to do well. And like you said, that pricing power and being able to offer premium products positions them in a way where where they will have higher margins than say your lower brand shoes and everything. It's just a matter of how diluted this market can be. And to your point, I think with a company like this, there's a lot of staying power when you fall in love with the brand. I personally am a big fan of Nike. I use Nike throughout all of my football career. I despised Under Armour, wouldn't touch it just because of the look and everything. And so (laughs) I think it speaks to it that you do find this connection with these companies and as well as that, perhaps the athletes that are tied to them as well. And so, you know, that obviously benefits in their corner when they can sign people and create a really sexy brand around their products. And so, you know, can it grow to 50 billion? Can it grow to a 150 billion? There's certainly an opportunity before and, or sorry, companies before have been able to do that. It's just a matter of now that they're obviously a more late entrant, they're a fresh product, but they're a late entrant. Can they be able to penetrate that market and get a position like the top dogs have reached? Yep. Yeah, no fair point. I think this is a company, you know, they're growing 30% a year. And I think that could end up being conservative when you see right now, they only sell $2 billion of these a year. There's a massive global opportunity. Um, the Paris Olympics are coming up. Apparently they're going to have a big presence there. 
That's all it really says. We don't really know what that means. Um, but I think this is a company with an awareness problem. They make an excellent product. Everybody who has them is willing to pay up for them. And they're just not well known. So I think this is a company that could blow up. You're not wrong, though. It's expensive. So it's like, how do we, you know, how do we justify what, what an appropriate price to earnings ratio is? I mean, it's not the Tesla mm-hmm. footwear, right? It's not like they designed, well, if you ask them, they might say the cloud technology is innovative like that. And it's innovative, but um, you know what I mean? It's like not redefining like a flying shoe or something like that, where we get confused yeah. about the valuation. They're just making a better shoe. So yeah. 130 times priced earnings is way too high. 50 something is still probably way too high. So I think this is a company that probably needs to grow a little faster than their guidelines of 30 ish percent a year. They probably need to do a little better than that. Um, in order to, to grow into this valuation. But I mean, you know, you're buying a, you're buying a, a really great company at a good price. What? There's a Warren Buffett quote in there, isn't there? You know what I'm talking about? Hey, you nailed it on the head. Yeah. Buy what a is wonderful it? We, business at a fair price. Wonderful business at a fair price. You like that more yeah. than what is it? A fair business at a wonderful price. Exactly. So yeah. judging by that, I mean, you'd say this is a, a wonderful business at a fair price, right? Mm-hmm. Or like close enough. So yeah. it, it catches my attention. And this is one I'm, I'm like very closely, very seriously watching. Yeah. And, and two points on that actually is, I think in the early stages of my investment career, I was very much focused on trying to get both the wonderful business and the wonderful price. But the reality is that a lot of these times, especially for good businesses, you're not going to get them at a significant discount. Now, there's obviously opportunities that come about where these companies may disconnect from their price. But what you have to really understand is that when you're buying a company like this, it probably will realize its value over time. And there's certainly going to be corrections in the short run, but it's also a young business. And Nike, I think, started in 1980 or something like that. So there's a long runway ahead. And for it to realize that potential, it's certainly there and they're positioning themselves well to do that. Yeah. And you you brought up a good point. I mean, times have changed (laughs) is the short answer. Like when I first read, where is it? And I know you read this too, Intelligent Investor, where I got it up here, Intelligent Investor, Ben Graham. That's a classic book on value investing. I finished reading that book looking for price to earnings of what is it? 15 or less. And I wouldn't consider a stock um, if it, if it didn't match up with that, but the truth is like, things have just changed. Like if you're finding a stock at a 15 or less price to earnings, there's usually something wrong with it. Like sales are slow or like negative in growth. Maybe there's financial issues. You know what I mean? It's usually like, there's usually a reason, um, valuations just don't seem to have the same saying importance is wrong. Obviously it's extremely important, but they don't, it's not the be all end all like it is. You know, Soundhound, wonderful example. We there's no financial ratio that makes that company make sense. And since we made that statement three weeks ago, the stock's up 113. <laughs> percent So it's it's a new world. I think long run valuation is the only thing that matters. You know, valuation and, and fundamentals of a business. It'll always revert back to that once the dust settles. Always. But in the near term, I mean, you can trade these things like crazy. So I almost want to update my thinking to account for some of that and and look at, okay, you know, a company like SoundHound, we don't like it, but it is clearly in favor with investors. What could we look at that would show that this is a trade over the next one month, for example? Now, doing that same analysis on SoundHound, I actually say, would say the reverse. I'd actually say over the next one month, I think it's very, 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 very likely that we're going to see a dip. But you get my point right? Valuations are just, there's so much more to it now with the whole world being able to invest, not necessarily looking at valuations, right? Yeah. Well, and and that was the big thing, right? Like back in the day, especially when Ben Graham was writing about it was a lot of these stocks were industrial businesses or really capital intensive companies with a lot of tangible assets. And, you know, they'd have factories, they'd have, you know, again, just a lot of physical assets. Whereas nowadays, a lot of that is intangible. And also, I, I don't know if it's true. It's hard to tell because of the current conditions we've been in over, say, the last 14 years, like since the great financial crisis. But it really does appear like businesses are growing faster overall, particularly in, say, the software sectors and heck, even like the retail apparel business. Like, I think businesses are, in general are just getting better. So you can't attribute, say, a certain price to earnings as your benchmark and be like, okay, 
if it's below 15, that's when I buy kind of thing. You just have to really gauge. Ultimately, like I, I really love using uh, a discounted cash flow model. I think it just helps me stay grounded in the process because a lot of these times you see these companies growing at say 40% year over year and you think, wow, like it, even if it drops to 30% or even 25%, that still seems like a great investment. But if you overpay for it, then it will ultimately correct to a price that weighs it more evenly. And that goes back to another Ben Graham adage is, you know, the, in the short run, the stock market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. And I think that still holds true no matter where you are. It's just that we are in an environment where businesses have gotten better. People are more savvy. Obviously, they're also reading books on the intelligent investor and all these other, you know, good investing guru books that help you realize how to run a good business. And thankfully, Warren Buffett has kind of laid out the success process. So there's a lot of ways that way. But, you know, again, going back to on, it's, it is a really good business. They're doing a lot of things well. And there certainly seems like there's an opportunity for them to reach a higher valuation. It's just a question of in the short run, is that going to be realized or is this something that's going to take 10, 20 years to really like fulfill that true growth potential? And if you're willing to hold for that long, then fantastic because you'll benefit either way. I may very well be. Well, we'll have to see. Um, yeah. I find the way I use ratios now is less about looking at the company and saying, you know, 15 or 30 priced earnings or, or below, I like it. It's more comparing to peers to be like, how are they valued in comparison to peers? And how are they valued in comparison to themselves over time? Like, have they historically traded at a 100 price to earnings and they're now at a 20? Okay, well, that's cheap for them. But are their competitors all at a five? Okay, well, no, then it actually is still overall probably quite expensive. So looking, comparing to Nike and Crocs, it's an expensive stock. Um, it grows a lot faster, has better margins. So, you know, a few years it catches Croc in revenue, but it's already higher valuation than Croc. So what's, you know, it's, it's, ah, man, this is a, this is a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just, it's a, such a healthy company that I really feel is just getting started. I just think there's so much runway for this, especially um, apparel counts for nothing. It's a shoe company, yeah. but they have apparel technically. So there's many angles they could grow into. Um, I have yeah. some of their apparel actually, and it's awesome. Like it's excellent quality. I feel like I'm wearing Lululemon. Like it feels more or less the same, but um, yeah, same, yeah. <clears throat> slightly more masculine brand, I guess. <laughs> I still have a tough time. Uh, it took me a while to get used to wearing something that had that kind of a name, but uh, I am over <laughs> that. But I think on is a little more palatable for uh, men, generally speaking. <laughs> I'll let yeah. them speak for no themselves. Though. <laughs> yeah. And, and just like one final point, I think the longer the horizon you have for a business like this, the better chance you have of succeeding as an investment. If you're trying to play this in the short run, who the heck knows? Like we were talking about with SoundHound AI, you could think that everything in the world points to you wanting to short the stock and then it continues to go up for the next year. And you'd be like, what the heck goes on, right? But if you hold it for 10 years, it really should balance out and you should realize that value that you sought after initially when you made that investment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be watching that short report so closely tomorrow <laughs> because if the short <laughs> position has come down a ton, then you know that was a squeeze over the last month and I would be yeah. way more likely to to take some kind of position myself, whether I short it directly or do it through an options contract. But yeah. tomorrow's the day. So maybe I'll, I'll let you know what I ended up. Actually, <laughs> uh, Edge Inside subscribers will know exactly what we do and we'll share our research. So if you guys want to sign up, we still have that discount going for another week or so. Uh, if you don't know, that's where we share all of our trades uh, as we make them, including our deep dive research. Nothing biased, nothing sponsored, just real research. Um, most likely one of these stocks will make it to that research list. Stay tuned. Uh, okay, topic three. We talked about AI, we talked about running shoes. Now, obviously, the logical transition is to flying cars. Um, <laughs> so let's course. talk about this company called Archer. So Archer Aviation and Falcon Aviation, they partnered to develop an, uh, what's called a vertiport. Uh, it's like a helicopter landing port. Uh, Vertiport infrastructure in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, which paves the way for the launch of Archer's flying car operations in the UAE, possibly as early as 2025. A couple key points. Uh, Archer's real claim to fame is their flying vehicle called Midnight. Pretty cool name. Uh, which supposedly will be cost comparable to ride sharing. Believe it or not, all electric and much quieter and safer than a helicopter. Estimates are actually that to manufacture, it'll be about a third of the cost of a helicopter, which is pretty cool. Archer Aviation also raised over a billion dollars and they've got half of it left, though they're doing an excellent job of blasting through it. Um, but this is a cool company that I'm excited to talk about. So 
given their commitment, Declan, to replacing 60 to 90 minute car commutes with shorter electric air taxi flights, <laughs> still hard to imagine. How does Archer plan to market and position its midnight flying car to attract consumers and possibly disrupt traditional transportation in, I guess, urban areas? Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to look at this midnight flying machine first. It is yeah. hella cool. And so cool. I mean, if you pulled up in one of those things, like, you know, you're walking out like a boss kind of thing, right? Laid. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, it's very impressive. And I think it's very interesting. You know, I was actually listening a while back to uh, Peter Diamandis podcast yeah. with the CEO on and uh, Adam Goldstein's his name. And, you know, he provided some really good insights there about what the business is doing now, how it's trying to position the company moving forward and how close it is to op full operations and hopefully eventually profitability. So things he outlined right now, they are really trying to market this towards high net worth individuals. As you said, Kev, they are burning through cash pretty quickly. I think it's like $300 million on average. And now they did a good job of raising about a billion dollars a few years back. And I got to give a little shout out. Ken Molis was actually the guy who really? signed that deal and executed, got all the investors on board and everything. So shout out to Molis and Co. Shout there. out to Molis. Um, That's the second yeah. time. I forget. What was the other deal that was syndicated with them recently? Um this is your oh, second one. That, uh, we'll we'll find it and cut back to it. But uh, yeah, I, I love to hear it, though. I love Molis. to hear it. So, okay. All right, yeah, all right. I think so. What he kind of outlined in that podcast was that they want to give people the experience of what it is to take a fifteen to 20, 20 minute flight that usually takes two hours in these highly dense urban areas. So right now they're trying to get things set up in New York City, in LA, and then now most recently with this new deal in Dubai and the um, American or not American Emirates. What am I saying? United I Arab Emirates. <laughs> yeah. United <laughs> Arab. What am I saying? So anyways, these highly dense markets that, you know, clearly it takes a long time to get through these highly congested areas. And so if they can show to these rich and wealthy people that, look, we can save you tremendous time. This is not only safer than helicopters, but also more efficient. It costs less. Well, why not put some money into this so we can make it a reality? And so that's where they are positioning it today because they need capital. They need money. They need, they're not going to reach profitability probably for at least, I don't know, four to five years. At they're, least. They're striving for 2025 operations, but to really scale that product out is going to take even more time. And then on top of that, they have to wait for regulatory bodies like the FF or FAA and other entities around the world to sign on to this and approve the actual flight of these machines. But for now, that's where they're at. And then eventually, like you said, they want to directly compete with Uber and offer a similar price where people can take those flights, avoid all the congestion and be able to have a pretty awesome experience. And again, stepping out of that bad boy afterwards and looking pretty damn cool is going to look good once you once you have the opportunity to do so. Man, like are we seriously talking about this like a, right. a flying car competing with Uber? Right? Like what how? <laughs> how I mean the price of Uber has gone up for sure, <laughs> but <Yeah>. to fly <laughs> um I'm so curious. I get mm -hmm. the use case. There's no doubt. Like, so where I live in Vancouver here, um, we have a ton of float planes. It's like a, a bit of a hub, actually. A lot of the world's float planes are actually manufactured um, just across the way on the island there. You, many people don't know that. But the I'm, look, I'm looking out my window right now, and I can see five float planes in action. And most of them are going from Vancouver to Victoria, which is our capital. Mm -hmm. A lot of the politicians do that. There's also a helijet, which is a helicopter. It does the same thing. And uh, just a massive amount of uh, transportation happens in that route and that method. And same can be said all over. Like when I was living in Miami, same thing. You see the float planes going everywhere. This is an amazing disruptor for that. But it relies on a lot of assumptions that I'm trying to wrap my head around. Like wh how is this a third of the price to manufacture compared to a helicopter when mm -hmm. it like – I don't want to say it looks somewhat similar being like a reason for it costing the same, but you know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. feel like a cheap version. Like it just feels like a different, more high tech version. So really, yeah. really curious about that. Obviously if they can hit that milestone, that's unbelievable. Who's not going to take a freaking flying car or whatever you want to go. Like it's a, yeah. the biggest no brainer the world has ever seen. I'm just so curious. Like 
how do you like, ah, oh, this is one of those companies. I so badly want to take a flyer on it because I think it's one of the coolest things I've seen guys. Seriously. If you haven't seen this, just go watch the freaking video. Usher's in it. <laughs> They've got Usher in their promo video. So you need. know, it's good. Uh, cause Usher is an expert at everything fly, flying car related, <laughs> and, but the, so they, they raised a billion dollars. They spent about half of it. Let's just assume the burn is somewhere similar this year. That gets them to 2025 where they think they're going to start uh, like very small scale core partners, like basically a test run, which I can't imagine is going to be very meaningful for revenue. If it's a tester, like it's got to be minimal revenue to possibly even a, a rev like loss by fixing problems as they go as you're testing things out. So the likelihood they're not going to need more need to raise more money feels extremely low. Um, yeah. I think dilution is for sure. Another wave of dilution is probably going to come, but let's just be optimistic. Let's just say mm -hmm. that 500 ish million they have remaining gets them through this year, maybe a little bit more. They launch some, you know, l small scale commercial operations. Maybe there's some great terms from that where it doesn't actually cost them too much, or maybe most of the R and D is already behind them. And by then they're just tweaking it. And maybe that's enough money to like slowly scale into commercial operations and they don't have to raise again. I'm saying that out loud and I don't actually believe it, but let's just, I'm sure your buddy Ken is getting another call sometime in the next few months. <laughs> they're probably talking already. Who am I kidding? Then there's, a, then there's somebody like a, like two major partners. The first of which is United. That's, you can't really think of a better partner. Uh, the ex CEO actually joined the board of Archer. So that's pretty cool. And I would love to know these terms, but they've actually made a $1.5 billion commitment to buying aircraft. And I just, I didn't dig too, too, too deep. Um, I actually just got way too lost in SoundHound. <laughs> I lost track of time, but I don't know what the terms are on that. Uh, Cause they only paid $10 million down. So I'm sure they're having a, the time of their life marketing at $1.5 billion in uh, oh, what booking backlog. <laughs> oh, some similarities. Uh, but if, if these companies only had to put $10 million down, what does that mean? <laughs> like, I'm sure they can cancel it in the blink of an eye. So, you know, when is the best case scenario that they could get that revenue in the door? Well, on their deck, they say 2028 is when they really commercialize it. So let's just use that as an example. So if they can get to some kind of operations in one year, they have to survive another three. Then hopefully before then they're bringing in revenue, but not necessarily... Like this is a flyer. Um, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with any other companies making flying cars? I I'm not, which is why I ask. I, I know there's others in the market. I don't know them by name, um, but th there's certainly like going back to the FA or FAA, they've actually been quite bullish on this market. And, you know, ideally, they obviously they're going to still maintain those safety regulations and on, or make sure everyone's compliant with them but they do want to bring these to market. Like you said before, they are safer than helicopters. So if they can replace the helicopter market alone, that's a major value add because they essentially do what a helicopter is doing, but they also have the benefit of transporting or flying horizontally. And this is a lot more power or energy efficient. And on top of that, it's safer. Like ultimately, you're, I don't know the physics behind it, but you clearly have experienced or seen things in the past where you can see a helicopter just spinning out of control and it leads to a crash. Whereas with this, you could essentially be able to glide to safety to some capacity and probably oh, minimize those risks. So I think the FAA is really bullish on that. And so they're inviting these companies and it's still a t capital intensive business by any means, but it's at least more promising than what has existed forever. And actually j just to go back on that point and return to cost, I, th I don't know if this is exactly why they have this benefit or they can achieve like one third of the cost of a helicopter. But these are at least a few reasons that the CEO listed is for one with lithium batteries coming to market and becoming scalable and actually being able to meet the energy demands of these materials that essentially is able to replace the power supply mm -hmm. as well as on top of that, it requires significantly less maintenance and don't quote me on this, but I want to say that he said that there's like 65 parts in one of these machines compared to a helicopter that has like over a thousand. And so it obviously takes a lot less uh, to actually maintain these products over time. They also require a quick charge and they're also less energy intensive overall. So that may add some reasoning to that. And then I just 
going on to the partnership side of things. So the other major partner they are with is Stellantis, who is the makers behind Chrysler and a bunch of other big name car brands. I can't remember. And what they're ideally trying to set up is for Stellantis to do a lot of the manufacturing. They He likened it to kind of how Apple designs their products, but then sends it over to Foxconn to actually craft these things together. And they're doing a similar thing where they're working not only by designing themselves, but also working alongside Stellantis to figure out the engineering and manufacturing side of things. But they ultimately want to kind of roll that out to a much bigger player who already has the factories and manufacturing in place to really scale this. So they've set themselves up for that on that side of things. And potentially that's another way that they can overcome, especially these early cost barriers that would limit a small company like this. And then the last point I wanted to add is he talks about how their ultimate goal is to be like this ride sharing business, but there are, there are ways where they can essentially get around some of those regulatory constraints where they may be able to sell some of these evil EV toll machines to places or certain like niche markets. And he lists out a good example of you could use them in the military for non-combative operations where you just need to transport soldiers in a short like short distance so there's there's definitely oppor- opportunities where they can start bringing revenue early on it's just ultimately like their big prize and goal is to be able to make this a mainstream form of transportation that is used everywhere hmm. see this is interesting because <clears throat> I feel like they they certainly seem to be the first mover or one of the biggest first movers. Mm -hmm. And I think that is going to go a long way in something that's brand new like this, where it's going to take a long time for the first people to get licensed. And then it's probably, it'll obviously take less time for for follow-ons after that. But I think a lot of the time and effort is going to be put into whoever they're approving first. And these guys seem to be working closely with them. Apparently, all or most of their parts, maybe the number was 80%, I believe, are are like pre-approved, if you can imagine. So it's like not brand new. It's more like off-the-shelf parts that are already familiar, um, right. that regulators are already familiar with. So I, I think that's what they're expecting. And because it's such like, well, a high fixed cost and a high technological barrier, I do feel the first mover is going to have a, a fair advantage because... <clears throat> they're going to be inking all these agreements with, I don't know, like UAE, great example. They have this partnership set up. I imagine they'll set up a bunch of partnerships like that, where unless something goes wrong, I don't think they're just going to ditch that partner on year two and get somebody new. I think that's going to be the partner of choice unless something massive goes wrong. So I do think their first mover advantage is going to be a big one here. The United partnership really stands out to me. I wish United took an equity stake. I'd be feeling even more bullish because what I want is somebody with the technical knowledge to put their money in to tell me that it's real (laughs) because I don't know how to look at it. And I see Usher and I'm like, hell yeah, let's go. We're in. This guy's a technical genius, obviously. Yeah. You know what? To be fair, maybe that's what Stellantis is. And actually you just educated me because I keep seeing that name and I didn't know who that was. So you're saying they actually, they're like the Foxconn for like Chrysler and stuff. Is that what they're just manufacturer or? Well, they actually are like a conglomerate of car manu. Oh, like they own so, those uh, brands. They they own the oh. brands and everything. And then, of course, the assets that go along with this. And the CEO actually likens it closer to a car than to an airplane or another form of aircraft, mm-hmm. simply because a lot of, like you said, the parts are very similar. And so I think, you know, United Airlines is a big partner and it obviously like shows some validation. But the real ticket here is with Stellantis because they're going to give them insights into how they can actually bring this to scale and then work alongside them to really like bring the operations to life. Because and one one last thing that the CEO mentions is that he likens the company itself a lot similar to a Tesla, where early on, you know. Obviously, it was losing a lot of money. It needed to bring it up to market. But being in that space and now having the technology where lithium-ion batteries are actually allowing it to be an operating business that actually has some potential is where this really comes from. Whereas, you know, say the airline industry, there's some innovation, but planes have relatively stayed the same forever. And I mean, heck, even look, Boeing still having problems today. So there's a, you know, they're trying to position themselves more as really a flying car versus, say, 
an aircraft mm-hmm. of sorts. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I'm uh, mm-hmm. I'm curious. Like, okay, I'm trying to put them against Soundhound. I man, I <laughs> talk about Soundhound AI stock so much here, but it's like I'm thinking, why do I love to hate Soundhound, and why do I love to love this when this is technically zero revenue versus forty five million? Um, they both have big backlogs that are we're not totally sure what it means. Fine, Soundhounds is is half, but they're both still meaningful. Um, Archer spends way more money, so technically much higher risk of going bankrupt. Um, so, t- so technically speaking, from those point of views, it's like not a substantially better stock. I, I think I get more interested because, for one, it feels like a bigger disruption um, in my mind, and it feels like there's going to be a much higher barrier to entry because, you know, a voice assistant in a car taking too long to respond or ordering you a Big Mac instead of chicken nuggets is kind of a lower stakes game than <laughs> than a flying car, you know, plummeting out of the sky. So I feel like there's going to be a higher barrier to entry. Um, the the equity valuation is half. So obviously it's it's cheaper. No revenue, fine, but pipeline's bigger. Something about it, it just interests me more. And I think it's the barrier to entry and the technological, like the true technological innovation that jumps out more. But it's not clear. What do you, what do you think when you kind of pros and cons with the two stocks? Yeah, I second that. What I am really attracted to when I look at different investments is how much of a contrarian are they being, both from a management side, but as well as the technology itself. And you na- you nailed it on the head with Archer, where they're really essentially disrupting and almost inventing inventing an entire new market, whereas a company like Soundtown AI is doing something that doesn't necessarily seem Marvel nowadays, now that everybody has seen and experienced AI and has got a taste for it. It just doesn't feel that unique. Now, that being said, from an inv- investment standpoint, I would really want to see it reach marketability and get to that scale. I think they listed that by like 2028, they want to reach 2,000 dollar or 2,000 vehicles created per year. Hmm. So I would want to wait until they can actually meet some of those objectives before putting a stake in a business like this. Because, like you said, they're burning cash, and it's they've certainly done well in the past raising capital. But you just never know. And if conditions turn and things get worse, it could be a lot tougher. And if they just don't have, or they're not far ahead enough at a point when that happens then they're going to run into trouble. And so you just have to be very cautious from that standpoint. It's a very cool mm-hmm. product. They're doing something that's awesome. It looks cool. It's amazing to watch, but you just have to balance out those fundamentals with the actual technology and what's going on there. Did I mention Usher was in their ad or did I not mention oh, that? I forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> Changed my mind completely. Ah, yeah. oh, interesting. Like, Further research, I think looking into competition is kind of be the, going to be the bigger task of mine next, because I think that's obviously key. Maybe we're just missing it, and there is another company that maybe is already publicly traded or is come, coming close. That could obviously be significantly negative. But other than that, I mean, they're progressing well. They got something really cool. It could be one of those stocks I'd put a small amount in now as a flyer, like almost like buying a meme coin, <laughs> meme stock of anything. Or sorry, I meant to say a, like an altcoin. 